What I'm going to do over the next 15 minutes, and I'm the Director of Urban and Land Use Policy for Reason Foundation, um, in many ways what I'll be doing is supplementing some of the things that Gabriel talked about. I'm going to sort of bring into the nuts and bolts of what's happening in transportation. And to give you a, a sense, and I'll also just comment, though, on the on the, trend, on the funding side, keep in mind that in the breakout sessions, there, is, there are going to be sessions devoted exclusively to the issues of funding and how we finance. Some of these questions which should be raised in those breakout sessions as well, um, because you can really get into the nuts and bolts of, of some of that. As, that. Um, what's been interesting for me, and what I think the presentation I'm going to give over the next few minutes is going to reflect, is not so much my background as someone who's been involved as a transportation engineer, but really a guy who has a passion for cities and trying to see those cities grow. And what has been, and um, of course, I'm the co-author of The Road More Traveled. Um, the, that book came out of a realization that traffic congestion was really strangling our cities, but we really didn't understand how, and it wasn't getting the visibility in the public debate to bring that issue into the forefront. So the book is really written as a way of exposing what that connection is. But in the process of doing that, we really started looking at things like how you privatize road infrastructure. And so what I'll be talking about are, are public-private partnerships. And think of the public-private partnership really as that practical connection between going from a completely publicly owned system to one that is more and increasingly privately um, provided. And really what I want to do is talk about why that's happening. Not only why it's happening, why it should be happening, and why it is happening now as opposed to not happening 20 or 30 years ago. Because I think it's actually pretty, pretty interesting because we're really living in a very different time and place when it comes to transportation. And I think we need to recognize that and the key is to capture that opportunity that exists right now to really move for policy reform. And all of that really moves toward a more private sector driven road and transportation system. So, um, first of all, let's keep in mind some basic information and data. The Texas Transportation Institute has been tracking congestion in 85 metropolitan air, urbanized areas for, uh, since 1982, and uh, they've recently expanded to almost all urbanized areas. But the bottom line is this. If we're going to try and improve mobility, which means trying to limit congestion, the solution is going to be roads. And that you can tell by looking at this graph, on the left, on the vertical axis, is really the change in congestion. The reason it goes from 0 to 400 is because they indexed it. So in other words, what you've got is an index where um, going from 0 and the growth is up to 400. Then they compared that to the investment urbanized areas put into their road system. The bottom two lines are the urbanized areas that were able to invest in the road system at least within 30% uh, within of the growth in demand for roads. They're the ones, now notice that congestion didn't go down, but what they were able to do is slow the rate of increase. The ones that decided that they weren't going to match the increase in demand with the road system saw their congestion increase dramatically higher. Now, so the bottom line is that if we're going to increase mobility, we have to think about roads. And most of the time, in most areas, that's going to be a dramatic expansion of the capacity of the road system. We might be able to use really innovative um, oh, thank you very much. We might be able to use um, innovative approaches to road pricing and traffic signal coordination and, and synchronization, um, ramp metering, sort of regulating when people get on the highways and that type of thing. But we might be able to squeeze another 15 or 20 percent out of our existing road system. We're not going to be able to reach, um, to really begin to grapple this until we think about adding physical capacity. Um, the other thing that we need to keep in mind is that the traditional sources of financing, and this will be discussed in the breakout um, sessions, are declining. Uh, this is the real value of cents per mile we're getting out of the gas tax um, at the federal level. And you can see it's been declining. Now, that's just the real value of the fuel tax. But let, keep, keep this in mind. And this is, for me, what is the, and even more important. Because not only is the real value of the gas tax falling, because we're getting better gas mileage and so we don't have to buy as much gas. But keep this in mind. By 2010, there will be 65 hybrid models of cars that are going to be marketed in the US. Now, I drive, now right now, if you look at hybrids, it's still a very small part of the market, but that's the growing part. And I bought a, uh, I, I bought a used, but I 
drive a 2001 Toyota Prius, which doesn't get as good a gas mileage as the newer ones. That had the effect of cutting our gas consumption in my household in half, simply by diverting our travel to the Prius and also my, my travel just becoming part of that. So that's not going to go away. I mean, that's, and that's a problem because how are you going to expand the physical capacity of your road system if you're relying on a funding source that is becoming a smaller and smaller share of what the overall solution is going to be? So where will the money come from? Bottom line is these public-private partnership agreements are going to be the critical part of it. Certainly in the short term and probably in the intermediate term. In the long term, we might be able to move to a completely privatized system, but that is a long-term uh, way of looking at it. And to keep in mind, for those of you that don't have experience with this, that this is what's really driving the public-private partnership opportunities in the U.S., the idea that the private sector can come and design, build, and operate these roads. Um, one is there, we're moving away from the toll booths. I mean, I remember in New Jersey growing up, throwing the quarter in the, in, on the Garden State Parkway. My grandfather loved it because he loved the game of trying to beat the uh, bell before it would go off. You know, he'd throw the quarter in, he'd try to get out before it turned, the light turned green and the bell would go off and all that sort of stuff. But bottom line, then, it's a hassle. It's also a safety problem. We're going to open road tolling. That's actually off of the newly opened um, Austin toll road. So you go through at highway speeds, and that's a, so a huge increase in convenience. The, by the way, the gantry on the right is for the people that don't have an easy pass, which is an electronic collection mechanism. So if you want to pay cash, you don't want it, you go into the right, you slow down, you stop, you pay them cash, then you go on. The other thing that's going on, and uh, Gabriel mentioned this, is the uh, 91 express lanes in Orange County. The key here is what's called dynamic pricing. You change, now, here is the paradigm shift. The, the traditional toll roads up on the left, and in Texas this is actually true right now, the primary purpose of getting the toll was to reco recover the money to finance the debt. Cut, you know, pay for the capacity and get rid of it. 91 express lanes, what they're trying to do is maximize the flow of traffic. What they want to do, they, yeah, they do want to cover the cost because that's the whole point. But the other thing they want to do is they want to guarantee a certain level of service to the people that are using it. You are guaranteed 65 miles an hour or very close, 60 or 65 miles an hour on the 91 express lanes in Orange County, California, which is saying a lot because everybody on the free roads is crawling at 15 miles an hour or less during drive time. And notice what happens is the toll increases in order to maintain that. So that's the mobility thing that's really important in all this. So what does this raise, the question? Well, economists, when we talk about the public provision of a service, we usually think of them in terms of a public good. Traditionally, we think the part now, Gabriel's research in smart growth uh, in uh, street smart really punches some holes in the myth. But the reality is most of us think that roads are provided because the government has to and the private sector won't. So that's a public good. So, but with these new technologies, with these changes, are roads really a public good? When we're talking about open road tooling, when we're talking about dynamic pricing, when we have the private sector coming in and plunking down billions of dollars to take over the management of the Indiana toll road because it's been so poorly managed that they know they can capture that value, they can upgrade the system and run it more efficiently. Are we still talking about a, a product that is a public good? And as Gabriel mentioned, the Oregon's charging per mile has the potential of completely changing the way we finance it based on a true user fee. Well, I think we're not. In fact, I think this is where we're going. And I think this is where public-private partnerships are beginning to show us. Um, first of all, if you can think about this, right now, right now, we could take almost every limited access highway in the U.S. and begin to convert it into more of a true user fee-based system using open road tolling and dynamic pricing. Now, not all of them are going to pay for themselves because they don't have the traffic density. The other thing that you have with sometimes, you actually, when the government's in charge, they provide too much capacity at times. But with the Oregon experimentation with pricing and with the major arterials, we actually are moving closer and closer to that point where virtually every component of the road system could be privately owned, operated, and managed. It's technologically feasible. It's not necessarily economically feasible yet, but we're getting there. Certainly we're in a different world than where we were before. One of the more interesting parts of this, um, and what really began for this to crystallize for me in writing the book The Road More Traveled, was looking at what was happening in other countries. Because we are way behind the times in the U.S. on this. If you look at what's happening in France, Australia, increasingly in China, in India, 
we are slow or are moving toward these kinds of approaches much more slowly. The A86 extension is completing the, per, the, the, which is essentially a beltway around Paris. And the dotted lines is, the, is actually a new road that's being built by the private sector. It had, it had been stopped for over 20 years for uh, political reasons. And, but in France, the, what happen, they have the ability to, for a private company to come to the government and propose a new project. And the problem with that section of the 86 is that it, went under, it, was, it would have gone through Versailles, which has some historical significance to France and most of Western civilization, one form or another. So what the private company said is, look, we can come in and build a tunnel. And they proposed it. The French government agreed to it. It's actually got some very innovative design, and it got done. And the private sector is recovering the full cost through tolls. First of all, public-private partnerships um, are really agreements. They are not really partnerships. It's not an equal relationship between the private and public sector. So let's keep that in mind. Um, they are the lease of an asset, so the private sector never owns the asset. Eventually, if the company goes bankrupt, it goes back to the government. It is, however, a major source of new capital. $3.8 billion is now has gone to the Indiana government, which has been earmarked for transportation improvements because of the money that they can tap into. Um, also, what we find is that there is a much better capacity to manage these facilities much more efficiently because if you're looking at running this facility on a 50, 75 year lease, you're thinking about the life cycle of it, not the next budget go around when you're asking whether you're going to have the money to fund it, which is the way our departments of transportation are managed. So we get new infrastructure and faster. It also minimizes the risk to the taxpayers. If Macquarie, which is a major investment firm, goes bankrupt, it's the equity holders in Macquarie that bear that risk. Um, that Indiana doesn't have to give the $3.8 billion back. Um, that's theirs. Um, how they work, private firm designs and finances and builds this over a certain amount of time. The key to making it work, and again, this is not a, sort of a, a, really an agreement among partners, there is a concession agreement, which is a government contract. In that concession agreement, the, the public interest is protected by specifying the length of the lease. Um, it identifies the revenue streams which will be going to pay for the private sector. Um, sometimes it's not, the tolls will not cover the full amount, so there's a guarantee of some sort from the government to ensure that the revenues are there in order to maintain the facilities and keep them going. It includes timeline. It also very often these include schedules for toll rate in, um, increases. Um, so one of the things that's been concerned about is monopoly pricing, but that can all be handled and is handled within the concession agreement. And usually, you know, if it's done well, it's done a competitive selection process. So it's not just simply getting one firm or soliciting one bid. Um, some of the concerns, and I'll, well, I've got, good, I'm actually getting close to where I want to be on this. Here are some of the concerns. Um, I think we, and these are, by the way, these are problems that can be solved and are being solved. Some of it is the lack of experience with the way things, things operate. But certainly at a Reason Foundation or Free Market Libertarian Group, privacy is a really important concern for us. So the question is, who's, what's going to happen with the data? Is this going to be another Big Brother type of mechanism? Well, what we've seen in practice is that this isn't that much of an issue because the data that's being collected is really, is the car going through the toll booth and is the person who's agreed to pay for it paying for it? That's about it as far as that goes. We do have to be constantly vigil vigilant about rent seeking, which is simply the willingness of the private sector to game the system for profit. Um, you, that's why you need a competitive bidding process as long as it's go uh, uh, to continue. And we also have to be wary that we're not just sort of implementing efficient socialism. We're just simply saying we're just going to use this to get more money to fund all sorts of other problems. One of the issues with the Chicago skyline was that the money came in from the private sector and it went into the general budget. So you can think of all sorts of mischief. Indiana learned from that and said, no, we're going to actually dedicate these funds to transportation infrastructure. And that is, I think, a critical part of ensuring that this is efficient. Um, red herrings have been, uh, what we find is that um, these are issues that have come up, which frankly, it doesn't take too far to get below the surface to realize that they're not as significant. Now, eminent domain is an issue that is very dear to the Reason Foundation's heart. And I've spent a lot of time testifying on behalf of property owners in it, on this issue. But the truth of the matter is roads have always been considered the pro province of the public sector. And so eminent domain 
as, a, uh, as an issue, a legal issue, simply does not apply because these are still, at this point in time, these are still publicly owned facilities. Um, they are being essentially under agreement, being managed and improved by the private sector, but the private sector doesn't own it. The other thing what we found in practice is that private companies that are on these lease agreements have an incentive to avoid legal ha um, haggling of any sort. And so we find that questions of property rights are resolved to the benefit of the property owners much more quickly than under the government who really doesn't care about the timeline. Every day a concessioner goes without people on their roads is a cost. And that figures very prominently in their bottom line. So they will very often do whatever they can to expedite the, the acquisition of the property voluntarily rather than going through the legal system, which immediately adds at least a year, probably more, under the resolution of that. And you can't afford to do that. Foreign ownership, you know, to be honest, the idea of a domestic and foreign owner anymore is simply no longer relevant. Every one of these bids that we're seeing where we've got a, a consortium coming together includes a combination of foreign and domestic companies. There are 20, I just on the plane counted up 28 different private equity investment groups that are now bidding on these. The, in the Pennsylvania Turnpike case, there were 12 groups that had put together bids for it. Many of them were mixes of U.S. and foreign firms. So again, foreign ownership, I think, is once you get beyond the surface. Monopoly pricing, um, keeping in mind that one, if uh, concession agreements very often put, regulate, or they regulate the rate of toll increase. But also remember, there is always, in most cases, there is an option. People can opt for the local roads. They can opt to go slow. They can opt for the free lanes. Very few cases where you dr truly have one highway that is the only option for a driver. The question is, are you willing to pay for the benefit? So the bottom line is I think the public-private partnership as an interim mechanism is getting us to more of a private sector market-driven system. It, it is a hybrid, so we're not talking about pure privatization. But as a practical way, this is really creating all sorts of new opportunities, unleashing innovation like we've never seen in transportation uh, in decades. And so we're really excited about the possibility of it, realize that there are potential problems, but we think that they are solvable and can be addressed. So with that, I'm finished with my formal remarks. I, I may have left one minute for Q&A at this point. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, here in California, we have a great history, or we used to have a great history, in providing, quote, freeways. Anytime you start to talk about putting some kind of a cost, you know, whether it's the Oregon system or a toll on a freeway that exists today, everybody says, oh my goodness, we paid for those with our taxes, you dirty birds can't come in and start charging us. How do we overcome that kind of argument? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, and I think it's a valid one. If we already paid for it, we're not going to charge us again for the, for the facilities. A couple things. One is, uh, there's a real hole in our public knowledge about what's going on. We have underinvested in these facilities. That's why we've got the pothole, well, plus inefficient government provision, I mean, bureaucratic provision of this. But the truth of the matter is, by almost any metric, we have been significantly underinvesting in our road infrastructure. And even, and part of that is because we went, well, <coughs> tolls were used initially in many cases to fund the inter the high, many of the highways. The deal was that they would immediately expire as soon as the debt was paid off. That meant that there's no longer specific dedicated revenue to fund that infrastructure, and we've been underinvesting ever since. And the result is the mess we've got now. So part of it is that we need to, people need to recognize that just because you're paying taxes doesn't mean, one, you're paying enough, or two, that that has been a consistent investment over the years to maintain, let alone expand the, uh, expand the system. The other is to keep in mind, I think this can be very important, is that as we move forward, let's think, forget about the past. As we move forward, the question is how do we provide these services at a level that we expect, and frankly, as an economist, we need. I mean, we can't have our trucks trying to get from one point of the country to the other in pothole-ridden um, interstate highways, um, as congested as they are. We need to move forward in a sustainable way, and I know that's an, a, a word that's abused a lot, and I will be abusing it in one of the workshops later on again. Um, but the only way that can be sustained over the long period is by t having a dedicated revenue source for transportation facilities so they don't get 
si um, siphoned off into other things. So the other thing is simply, we, if we continue to move forward on this current system, it's only going to get worse. It's not going to get better. So if people have an alternative, I'd like to hear them. Um, frankly, I haven't seen it. Uh, they've been trying to raise the gas tax in Congress, and they've gotten nowhere with it. Um, I mean, it's talked about. So I think there are some practical issues, too. But I think ultimately it's this getting this idea that the people that use these services really should be paying for it rather than everybody paying for something that not everybody uses. We have time for two more. Um, yep. Um, if I'm from Seattle, and if you look at what's happening in transit in Seattle, it's very hard for me to not presume that the people who run the public bureaus and the policy making to govern them are looking more out of after the interests of the vendors than they are the public. Uh, and yet, wouldn't these same people have to be the ones that negotiate these concessions? In other words, what, what level of confidence can we have that the public interest will be scrupulously protected by the, and, and, and not be penetrated by the private interest? That's a good question. I mean, how do we know that the same bureaucrats that have mismanaged the system now and mismanaged transit are going to be in charge of managing the, the road system? Um, first of all, it's a great question, but I think we need to keep in mind that we need to compare sort of real, not so much think about what the ideal ought to be, but think about the real world of concession, both in transit versus uh, as roads. And I still think on the margin we're better off by working more to a concession model where we're actually actively involving the private sector. Here's the difference with roads. You can make money with roads. You can't make money with transit. Transit is always going to be steeply subsidized. At least in the near term, we've got lots of facilities, road facilities, where there are opportunities to expand, where the private sector, if they manage it correctly, are going to be able to make money. And by making money, that creates a market discipline that does not exist in transit. So the problem with transit is that you've got the bureaucrats who are supposedly looking out for the minority of the people who really pay 20% of the cost of the facility. So there's no incentive for the vendor to pay attention to the customer. It's very different in many of the, most of the facilities we're talking about here. One more question, yeah, in the back. In these new facilities that have uh, electronic tolling and they go 60, 65 and just keep going, do they have differential pricing for motorcycles versus cars versus semi? Yes, and in fact, you, um, one of the beautiful things about this technology is the way you can differentiate that and you can have different classes of charging at different times, and so really, you could almost, you almost completely price discriminate if you want based on how you want to set it up. Thank you very much.